originally I'd gone to the valley to pick fruit. I worked at Red Bank's, Bank's fruit company up in Woodlake, um, Nash to Camp. I was working for various um, fruit companies in the summer of 1965. And the labor camp I was living in um, outside of Farmersville, um, they had begun a, begun a rent strike there. And that's how I met Gilbert Padilla um, and David Havens from the California Migrant Ministry. And they began telling me, gosh, you know, what, what we need is a union. And boy, I agreed with that right quick. Um, at Wood Lakes, we were working for 10 hours a day, $1.25 an hour, no unemployment, no workman's compensation, no social security, no bathrooms. Um, you could drink water from the irrigation ditch, or the forewoman would give you water for a nickel a cup. Uh, in those days, they could deduct social security from your check, but they didn't have to turn it in unless you worked at least 30 consecutive days. But you never knew where they turned it in or not, so the labor contractor, like Julio said, he, he would just pocket it at the end of the season, and it was the worker's responsibility to find out whether any of that money was ever turned in or not. So a worker could work for years and years and all this money deducted, and then he checks with Social Security and there's nothing there. It had just been pocketed. So when I first uh, began talking to Gilbert Padilla, and he began saying, oh, and what we need is a union, and all the workers get together, and gosh, it seemed like a great idea to me. And the crews I were, was in, um, there were Anglos, there were Blacks, there were Filipinos, there were Chicanos, there were all different races. Now, were all the workers, like the Hispanics, the Asians, were all they treated alike? Oh, no, there was tremendous discrimination. And there was discrimination from one group to another. The camp I worked at, at Tenneco, was a farm labor camp where most of the workers were either Filipino or Arab. And the foreman had been a Filipino, and there'd always been room in the camp for the Filipino workers. He could always find a bed in the camp. And when an Arab worker wanted a room in the camp, he had to pay $10. The, the foreman called it a mattress fee. Well, the Filipinos got the mattresses for free. The Arabs had to pay. When the union came in, there was a hiring hall. And you were dispatched to that ranch, regardless of race, creed, color, whatever, you know. Um, and I happened to choose that camp because I had a friend, Rudy Reyes, who was a Filipino, who was a good friend of mine. I said, do you know where Rudy's working? Oh, he's out at Tenneco, camp number one. So that's where I asked to be dispatched to. But when we got there, of course, what we wanted to do was treat everyone fairly. And it was a delicate situation because we wanted to treat the Filipinos fairly, but they'd been in a very privileged position before. And in effect, they were giving up some of those privileges under the union contract. And it became a different, difficult thing over the history of the union that some Filipinos did come to resent the union because the power that, that the Filipino foreman had had before the union was cut down by the union. And in, the fa in fact, we eventually fired our union, our uh, Filipino foreman. Um, in those days, the foreman was within the union. And the new foreman was also Filipino, but he was much more um, impartial. He wasn't, he didn't discriminate against the Arabs. In our particular crew, the discrimination was against the Arabs rather than against um, the Anglos or the Blacks or the Chicanas or whatever. But in a lot of situations, the foreman would use one race against the other. And when there was a strike, they would bring in strike breakers from another race or another province. I mean, I've been in crews where the foreman would try to get the people from Michoacan fighting against the people from Jalisco, you know. and. It's a typical situation in any employment situation where the foreman will try to divide the workers and get them fighting among themselves rather than uniting to improve the conditions for everyone against the boss. There wasn't specific discrimination against me because I was an Anglo, if that's what you mean. In fact, probably I would get deference because I could read, I could write, I could go to the police if someone, you know, <laughs> treated me wrong. But there were among the Arab community, they were like a captive nation. They had no English or Spanish. Couldn't even write in our alphabet. It was a different alphabet. And 
the union all of a sudden said, you have all the same rights as every other American worker, you know, and you shouldn't be treated like that. And you have the same rights as, you know, the president's son or whoever. You're, you're protected by the Constitution. There are just so many benefits now compared to 1965. And even outside the union contract, all the benefits that are, are available, um, unemployment insurance and social security and workman's compensation and toilets in the fields, and I mean, all of that is because of the union. Um, nobody was talking about any of that in 1965. In fact, the growers were complaining that the Bracero program was being ended. So it was like, it was like a different world. The, the ideal situation that the growers liked was where workers were, were brought up from Mexico or from Portugal or from Yemen and were like a, a captive workforce with no rights and the growers would work them as hard as they could for the harvest and then ship them out and no, no feeling of obligation at all for those workers that were producing the food for America.